Daniel chapter 8, and we're going to read together the whole chapter. As you'll see from the first verse, Daniel continues with his visions, although we've moved on two years. You'll notice in chapter 8, verse 1, in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision. The beginning of chapter 7, we saw in the first year, in the first year of Belshazzar, Daniel had had a dream. As we were seeing last week, one of the great themes, probably the greatest theme that comes through from that dream was that whatever evil can be churned up in this world, there is a God who sits in the throne, and when he decides, that evil is brought to an end. Remember we saw that in verse 21 of chapter 7. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment. And a similar theme we'll see as we read through this chapter 8. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came towards the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. And I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power his large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. You see, this vision, this dream, has no less grotesque imagery than the previous one. But in this one, we get fairly specific, as we'll see in a moment, fairly specific interpretation of what these animals stood for and represented. Verse 9. Out of one of them came, that is, out of one of these four horns, out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land, the promised land, the land of God's people, Israel. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth, probably a reference to God's faithful people, and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host, God himself. It took away the daily sacrifice from him at the temple, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it, and it prospered in everything it did. Truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary and of the host that will be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings 
And if that refers literally, <clears throat> then we're talking about a period of some six and a half years. And numbers like this are taken up more fully in chapter 9. But it may be there was an evening and there was a morning sacrifice. So it may be a period of three and a quarter years. The commentators love to argue about these sort of things. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Then we come to the interpretation. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Ulai calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. And as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And then he touched me and raised me to my feet. And he said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that we saw at the beginning of this chapter, the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, as happened in history, but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many, and take his stand against the Prince of Princes, God himself. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been given to you is true, but seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay ill for several days. And then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Amen. And may God bless us and teach us from his word. This evening, again, to the eighth chapter of the book of Daniel. I trust in our last two studies on Sunday evenings, we've begun to see how remarkably relevant these chapters are for us living today. We're reminded as we study God's Word that it doesn't merely have antiquarian historical interest. Rather, God's Word is living and powerful. It speaks to every age and to every generation. And that's why Paul's words to the Christians in Rome, in Romans 15, is so relevant for us as we grapple with these extraordinarily difficult chapters in the book of Daniel. He wrote to them, for everything that was written in the past, including Daniel, and including these, at first sight, bizarre chapters with their visions and dreams, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. We're not dealing therefore with some kind of antiquarian historical study. We're dealing with the relevant living word of God that speaks pertinently to every age and to every generation. Now in one sense at least, Daniel's vision in this chapter is easier for us to understand than his vision in chapter 7. Precisely because we have here in this 8th chapter an interpretation 
of the imagery that Daniel beholds in his vision. From verse 15 onwards, Daniel is given a precise historical interpretation as to the meaning of these strange creatures that he beheld in his vision. Now, the relationship between this chapter and the previous chapter seems to be this, I think. In chapter 7, the vision that God gave Daniel swept through history to its ultimate and inevitable end. That is the defeat and demise of evil. And we saw at the end of chapter 7 how the Lord God would ultimately step into human history and bring a crushing defeat to the Antichrist and bring his people into the everlasting glory of his presence. And so in chapter 7 we have this panoramic sweep that takes us from the time of Daniel to the end of human history with the great assurance that God will one day step in bring evil to an end and usher in his everlasting kingdom of righteousness for all who believe. Now in chapter 8, in contrast, the immediate focus of this vision is more limited. Although as we shall see, it does have uh, a connection with the last day. But the immediate focus of the vision is more limited. Its particular focus concentrates upon the immense suffering that the people of God would endure approximately 300 years after the time of Daniel. We're dealing here with prophecy. And what is absolutely remarkable is that everything that is prophesied through Daniel came to pass. It's one of the great testimonies to the truthfulness of Scripture. That all that it prophesies comes inevitably to pass. And this chapter, I think, was particularly given by God through Daniel. So that at a later date, his people would be encouraged to know in the midst of great suffering that their times were in God's hands. That their suffering would be indescribably awful, but it would be brief. You'll notice in verse 14, Daniel is told regarding this awful sacrilege and this awful persecution that will afflict the people of God, how long? How long will it be? And the angel says it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. And if we're to take that literally, it means approximately six and a half years. And so the great concern of this chapter is God saying to his people, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of all that will yet come upon you, hold on. Don't give up. Don't cave in. Hold on. Evil has its day, but its day is limited. Your persecutor himself will be crushed and broken. And that's a great encouragement, isn't it? If we were simply to think that this was all that there were in the world, repeating cycles of inhumanity and violence, if we simply had to believe that until the end of time, as it were, this was all that there was, the triumph of evil, the trampling of the weak, the persecuting of God's people, we would lose heart. God is saying to his people, don't lose heart. Because I am in control. And I will have the last word. I will see to it that evil will be vanquished. And my people will triumph. Let's then look at this chapter and see what God would instruct us in it. Daniel, first of all, has a vision of two kingdoms. Two kingdoms represented, as we see in the opening verses of the chapter, by two animals. One of them, a ram with two horns, who stood beside the canal. And the other was a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes. 
who came from the West. And these two kingdoms are identified for us in verse 20 and 21. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. And the shaggy goat with the horn between its eyes is the king of Greece, Alexander. And the large horn between his eyes is the first king. And so in this vision of the ram with the two horns and the goat with the single prominent horn between his eyes, Daniel is given a prophetic insight into the unfolding of world history. And in particular, what this vision speaks about is this. It tells us that the ram with the two horns will for a time be unrivaled in its supremacy. Look what we're told in verse 4 about this this ram, the kingdom of Medo-Persia. It charged towards the west, the north and the south. No animal could stand against him. None could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and he, he became great. And this is precisely what happened. Between about the years 550 BC to approximately 350 BC, the great kingdom of Persia and then Medo-Persia reigned supreme. It conquered to the north, it conquered to the south, it conquered to the west, it never ventured to the east. The kingdom did as it pleased. But suddenly, almost out of the blue, another kingdom arose. With tremendous rapidity, Alexander managed somehow to to coalesce, to bring together the divided nation-states of Greece. And, as we read in verse 5, came bounding from the west without touching the ground. And those of you who know your ancient history will know that the great um, march of Alexander when he swept east was one of the most remarkable events of human history. He just swept everything before him. Hardly as it were touching the earth. He came and confronted Medo-Persia and crushed Medo-Persia. He attacked the ram furiously striking the ram, shattering its horns. He did precisely what the word of God said he would do. But then in turn, we're told that while for a time none could rescue from his power, and the goat became very great, the kingdom of Greece became very great, at the height of Alexander's power, he was broken. He was brought crashing down. And in his place, Four prominent horns grew up. And we're told in verse 22 that the four horns that replaced the one that was broken off represents four kingdoms. And 200 years after Daniel writes this, this happened. The kingdom of Greece that had almost conquered the known world after Alexander's death was divided into four. There was the kingdom of Macedonia, Thrace and Asia Minor, Syria and Egypt. Once more, nothing happened other than what the scriptures predicted. Now, what a comfort this must have been to God's people in later years as they looked back and as they said, God's told us all about this. He told us this would be, and it has come to be. What God said would be has come to pass. You see, this should never surprise us. Because everything God says in his word is true. And we have here but a little cameo that says to us, God knows the events of human history. He knows how they will unfold. Be of good cheer. History is not running out of control. History is under the sovereign overlordship of him who reigns and rules above the heavens. Precisely what what God told to Daniel came to be and to pass. Should that not make us then heed all that God says? If all that God says is true, if what God says will be, will be, would you not be a mad fool to ignore what God says? Should you not rather be wise and heed all that he says? Be wise. 
take God's word to heart because it's true. What God says will be, will be. And so we have this vision of the two kingdoms. But secondly, and more particularly here, we have the vision of this little horn who grew out of one of the four horns that had come out of the broken single horn. And although this little horn, which we read of in verse 9 following, is not specifically identified for us, we know very accurately from history who he was. He was a man called, and perhaps you'll forget the name quickly, Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth, no less. Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth. And he arose, we're told, out of one of the four horns that had come out of the single horn. And historically, this is what happened. Out of the Syrian quarter of the old Grecian Empire arose Antiochus Epiphanes. And he rose to prominence and he overwhelmed Egypt. Look what it says in verse 9. Out of one of them came another horn which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east. And what Antiochus did was when he rose to prominence in Syria he marched south and conquered Egypt. He went east and overcame old Medo-Persia of the remnants of his kingdom and then finally he turned his attention toward the beautiful land the land of Canaan, the land of God's people that's precisely what happened historically around about the year 171 BC and more than that, verses 10 to 12 all that is predicted of him in these verses he did he grew until he reached, as it were, the host of heaven. He threw down the starry host to the earth and trampled on them. He set himself up to be as great as the prince of the host. He took away the daily sacrifice from the temple. The place of the sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints, the people of God in the daily sacrifice, were given over to this horn. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground between the years 171 and 165 BC this is what Antiochus Epiphanes did he marched into Canaan and he all but trampled the Jewish people under his feet he blasphemed he desecrated the temple he set himself up in the temple to be honoured and worshipped and he removed every vestige of opposition truth was thrown to the ground now you might ask yourself well, why all this detail why all this historical prophetic detail surely in order to give support and hope to God's people at a time of unimaginable suffering so that when this man Antiochus came to prominence People who knew their Bibles would be able to say, this is exactly what the Lord said would happen. Don't we say that to be forewarned is to be forearmed? God is telling his people so that his people will be armed against that day. So that they will be prepared to meet it and not be overwhelmed by it. As if to think, where is God in all of this? Has he abandoned us? Rather they will say, how good of God to forewarn us of this. How good of God to alert us to this so that we may not be caught off guard. But another reason I think why the Lord gives them such detail here, it's in order to assure them that the evil reign of this man Antiochus Epiphanes would be brief. We're told this in verse 14. Because having heard of the devastation this man will, will wreak, Daniel says, how long, Lord, how long is this going to last for? And the angel says, Daniel, it will take 2,300 evening and mornings and then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Verse 25, he will cause deceit to prosper. He will consider himself to be superior. 
when they feel secure, he will destroy many. He will take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. God is saying to his people, there is facing you a time of unimaginable suffering. But be of good cheer. I know all about it. I know all about it. And it will be brief. Hold fast. Press on. Endure. And precisely as God said it would be, it was. In the year 165, just over six years after Antiochus invaded the beautiful land, there was the revolt of Judas Maccabeus. And there was the overthrow of Antiochus. There was the reconsecration of the temple. It happened just as Daniel's vision predicted. Notice two significant things we're told here about Antiochus Epiphanes. We're told in verse 24 that he will become very strong, but not by his own power. And God is saying something very significant to us here. Remember when Jesus was on trial before Pilate? Pilate said to Jesus, when Jesus remained silent before him, he said, why are you not speaking? Do you not know I have power to hand you over to be crucified? And Jesus said to him, you would have no power over me unless my Father gave it to you. You are nothing but a tin pot nobody. The only power you have is the power my Father is pleased in the sovereignty of his purposes to grant you. And we are being reminded here that all power, even all evil power, ultimately resides in God's hands. He is God Almighty. Evil is never autonomous. It is never able in its own strength to exercise power. God may give evil a long reign, so long at times that we wonder what on earth God is up to. But ultimately, he's in control. Are you learning that the sovereignty of God is a profoundly reassuring truth? That it's a truth that can bring hope and peace to your soul in the darkest of days and at the most difficult of times? That God is in control. It is his power that governs the cosmos. And notice in verse 25, we're told something else. At the end of verse 25, he will be destroyed, but not by human power. He will become strong, not by his own power. And this Antiochus will be destroyed, but not by human power. In other words, the demise of Antiochus Epiphanes in 165 would not be the result of geopolitical force. God would see to it. You see, when you read history... And I'm an avid reader of history. You'll discover that historians record events as they appear. If you were to read the history of Alexander, or the history of Antiochus Epiphanes, you would have their, their rise to power charted in terms of political forces and social events and economic undercurrents. And when it came to describing their overthrow, it would be described in terms of moral failure and, and failure of strategy in battle and this power against them and that power against them. But the ultimate truth is this. Antiochus was brought crashing down by the power of the living God. Nobody ever describes history in terms of divine supernatural intervention. When historians come to chart the demise of communism in, 18, in 1989, what place will they give to the intervening sovereign power of God? What place will they give to the decree of the Almighty who said, enough is enough? Do you know these marvelous words in Isaiah chapter 40? Where Isaiah says to God's people, do you not know? Do you not understand? The Lord God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth 
and its people are like grasshoppers. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. He does it. Nobody else. And so it was with Antiochus Epiphanes. He will be destroyed, but not by human power. What a blessed encouragement that must have been to God's people as they faced up to unimaginable suffering. Their times were in God's hands. History was not out of control. What a great thing for us to take to heart. Because are there not times in this world and in our own personal world history when at times we might think, Lord, everything's going to pieces. Everything's going to pieces about me. And then we turn to the word of God and are reminded that our times are in his hands, that the nations of this earth are in his hands, that at the heart of the universe there is the throne of the ancient of days who is working out his perfect will and purpose mysterious to us, but one day a purpose that we shall understand and glory in. That's where the believer's confidence lies in life. I belong to a sovereign God to whom the rulers of this earth, the Gorbachevs, the Bushes, the Clintons, the Majors are but as grasshoppers. He brings them up. He brings them down. He is the one at the helm of human history. And so when dark times come, it is this we cling to. You have no power, Satan, but the power that my God grants you for a season. And even then he will see to it that all things will work together for good to those who love him. Well then, so much generally for the chapter. Let me something, simply make a number of applications as we close tonight. If I told you how many, your heart would fail you. Let me make a number. First of all, consider well here the truth of God's word. What God said would be came to pass. But beloved, the word of God prophesies of other future events. God's word is not only concerned with what is past, but with what is future. And God tells us in his word that one day he will establish a judgment seat. And on that seat will reign the Christ of God. And he will judge all men and women. And determine their everlasting destiny. What came to pass in Daniel's time is an encouragement for us to believe that what God says will be, will be. Are you living your life in the light of all the promises and prophecies of Scripture? Are you living your life in the sure knowledge that one day you will be summoned before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to have your everlasting destiny determined for good or for ill? There is the truth of God's Word to reckon with. Secondly, there is the encouragement that we can take from passages like this. The encouragement that while evil has its day, its day is numbered. The certainty of the coming of men like Antiochus Epiphanes and in our century Hitler and Mao Zedong and Pol Pot, the certainty of Antichrist's comings should make us serious. But the certainty of their removal should make us rejoice. Evil has its day, but its day is numbered. The third thing we notice here, and this is quite remarkable, I think. I wonder if many of you had ever heard of Antiochus Epiphanes before tonight. I would venture to say perhaps no more than two or three. How many of you had heard of Alexander the Great? Probably the vast majority. And yet... The greater prominence in this chapter is given to Antiochus and not Alexander. You look at history books of the ancient world. You'll find screeds about Alexander. You'll hardly find a line about Antiochus Epiphanes. Why is he given such great prominence here compared to Alexander? For this reason. 
because he defied God and opposed and oppressed the people of God. And God gives the greatest attention to those who touch the apple of his eye, which is his people. You see, God does not view world history as the world views it. God says, I'll tell you, I'll tell you whom I'm going to put my finger on, and it's Antiochus, because he dared to defy me and to trample upon my people. I fear greatly for people, not least in this town, who oppose the people of Christ. You remember when Saul of Tarsus was confronted by this shining light in Acts chapter 9 on the gates of Damascus. And he said, a voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul was persecuting Christians. But to the Lord Jesus Christ, touch my people and you touch me. It's an awesome thing to think that you're setting yourself against the risen Lord Jesus Christ. God gives the greatest attention to those who touch the apple of his eye. A fourth thing is this. And we don't have time really to look into it in some detail. We may come back to it. In Matthew 24, our Lord actually refers to the desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes. But he seems to suggest in Matthew 24, and try and follow this, that this desecration is not only a past event, but a future event. And what our Lord is telling us in Matthew 24, verse 15 and 16, I think, is that Antiochus Epiphanes is a prefiguring, a precursor of the ultimate Antichrist, of the one who will ultimately stand against God and his people, and whom the returning Christ will slay when he returns in the glory of his presence. In other words, everything Antiochus did is what the ultimate Antichrist will do. He will publicly defy God. He will publicly set himself up to be worshipped as God. He will publicly trample upon the people of God. He will publicly seek, as this man sought to do here, to destroy what is called the daily sacrifice here. It would seem to be he will seek to destroy the worship of God's people. Everything Antiochus was, is what the ultimate Antichrist will be. History is full of Antichrists, little Antichrists, if you like. Anyone who opposes Christ and his people is an Antichrist. And so when we read in verse 19 that this vision concerns the appointed time of the end, it may be there are two references here. A reference to the tragedy the Jews would suffer under Antiochus and the ultimate end when before the return of Christ, as we saw last Sunday evening, things will be so bad for the church of Jesus Christ in this world, it will be hardly seen to exist publicly. Everything the ultimate Antichrist will be Antiochus Epiphanes was. And our century is full of antichrists. Hitler was an antichrist. Paul Pott was an antichrist. But there are many more cultured antichrists. Everyone and anyone who opposes God and the work of Christ is considered antichrist. The fifth point is this, and we're almost at an end. To God, all antichrists are little horns. What is the description of Antiochus Epiphanes? He's described throughout this passage as a little or small horn. His power was impressive, but to God, he was a little horn. I love that. It reminds me of those verses in Isaiah 40. To God, but a grasshopper. 
to the world he looked a mighty impressive power to God a little horn to God the great Medo-Persian empire is nothing more than a lopsided ram to God the might of empire Greece of the Grecian empire and Alexander a woolly sheep and Alexander the great a brittle horn that God could snap off like that we need to look at the world as God sees it. And all these impressive powers that rise up and say to ourselves before God the Lord, you're but as grasshoppers. You're but as nothing. Is that how we see this world? Are we able to see the world as God sees it and not be overwhelmed by its, its presence and its appearance? Evil can seem so powerful and so impressive that at times you might feel it's about to engulf you. Then you stop and think. To God, the great Medo-Persian Empire was a lopsided ram. The great Grecian Empire, a woolly sheep. To God, you're but as nothing. There is but one power at the heart of this universe and it is the power of him who is my father in Christ. And the last thing is this, and with this we close. Throughout this chapter, the great prominence that is given is to the little horn that would rise up and oppose God's people. In the New Testament scriptures, we read of another horn and the word horn just stands for power, you remember how the angel Gabriel, the same angel who came to Daniel, also came to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, and later to her husband, Zechariah. And when John the Baptist was born, just before the birth of God's son himself, in the Gospel of Luke we find Zechariah speaking these words. Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up for us a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. The world we live in is full of little horns, little powers that rise up and arrogate to themselves power and prominence, that set themselves against God and his purposes and his people. But God has raised up his own horn. And that horn was a lamb. And that lamb is at the heart of the throne of God tonight in heaven, reigning the cosmos. This horn of salvation is God's lamb. And he came and by his death and resurrection he conquered sin and death and hell and ranged against all the little horns that this world can throw up, and ranged against the ultimate Antichrist who will yet appear, there stands the Lamb. But this Lamb is the all-conquering Lamb of God. And so the ultimate issue in life is this. Are you on the side of this Lamb? Are you on the side of this horn of salvation? Because ultimately, as we've been seeing in our studies, the world is divided into two camps. There are those who belong to God and his people. And there are those who live without God and apart from his people. Have you taken refuge and found shelter and security in this horn of salvation? Do you belong to that Lamb who reigns at the heart of God's throne in heaven tonight? That's why a Christian can look at world history and it seems to go from bad to worse and look at all that might yet be and say, My God is the one who reigns. 
and my times are in his hands. He may give evil a long reign, but ultimately he will triumph and be seen to triumph. That's the only way to live. That's the only way to stand so that when evil comes and when it threatens to overwhelm, we can be encouraged by this. Your day is but for a moment. God will bring your day to an end and bring me and all who are his into everlasting glory. That's the message of Daniel. God reigns. Evil has its day. God will bring it to an end. And ultimately, it is those who belong to the Lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. It's those who belong to the Lamb who will triumph and who will be brought at the last into God's glorious presence. May God encourage us to know that the Lamb is our Lamb and that he has become for us a horn of salvation. May God bless to us his word. Let us pray. We cannot begin to fathom such love to us, almighty God. We can but bow in adoring wonder that the Son of God should have come and given his all for the likes of us. Receive us then, we pray. Grant us your grace to live unto this Son of Man to whom has been given the dominion, the glory and the power unto all eternity.